Everybody hear me? All the way in the back, can you hear me? Well, we got some empty seats here. I wonder if everybody's over in the Chevrolet theater. <laughs> I guess so. We're always anyway. in the wrong place, aren't we? <laughs> How many of you saw our presentation yesterday? Yay! <laughs> Just Jake, okay. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, we're going to do something a little bit different today, but we're going to try to cover uh, most of what we covered yesterday just to make sure people who missed it uh, get the full story. Uh, but we're going to throw in a few things. There's a lot of questions about uh, pricing, uh, details on pricing. So uh, we added a, a slide on options prices to talk about what stuff's really going to cost so you can price out your car completely. Good. And uh, we have Dave Tappen here today. I wanted to have him come over and talk a little bit more about what's going on in the assembly plan. So let's uh, run through this. Next slide, please. Okay, well as we like to say, we designed this car in Michigan, we build it here in Kentucky, and we race to sell it around the world. We've got a lot of people here uh, from Michigan. You can see the, the crew that we have that's come down. A tiny fraction of the whole team, probably about a thousand people uh, working on the car right now. Uh, and that's just in Michigan, getting the, the rest of the design and development work done. So uh, when you see these folks, uh, don't hesitate to go up and uh, thank them. It's not just Harlan and me and Dave doing the car. Everybody uh, in this picture has a huge role to play. Build it here in Kentucky and uh, work's going on really hard uh, over here at the plant right now. Uh, did some of you sneak over and look, peek through the fence yesterday and see some cars? Yeah. Okay. Glad, glad you got to see them. They weren't on display. They just happened to be parked out there. I want to make sure uh, people got a chance to look at it. So a lot of folks uh, here supporting the bash, but there's a whole bunch more uh, actually uh, over the plant working. Next slide. Okay, Harlan, you want to talk yeah, about 2013? I just want to mention uh, Corvette's our favorite Chevrolet, but uh, 2012 Chevrolet had a big year, almost 5 million cars globally, and 60% outside the US, so uh, we're becoming a very international company as well. So uh, I know Corvette's our favorite, but if you're looking for another type of car or truck, check out what Chevrolet has. Racing, um, we're very proud of the uh, ALMS championship season last year. Manufacturers champions, drivers champions, and team champions. Yeah! yeah. And we're off to our defense this year. I don't know how many people saw Doug Feehan and Tommy Miller and Dan Banks. Those guys are those guys are great. You know, they're off to they're off to a good start at Sebring. You know, we, I was at that race, all three of us were at that race, and what an exciting finish, pa Tommy passing the Ferrari in the last, last hour of the race. And uh, so we got a first win, and then a reward for that was more weight penalty, more restriction penalty, things like that. So that, that's racing, but um, we're, gonna, we're really going to try to defend our championship again. And it's really important because the cars we race against are the same cars that we sell against on the showroom, both street and, and on the track. The, um, also, we started the, the Rolex uh, um, Grand Am series, which is going to be merged. And in our first year with the Corvette Daytona prototype, also manufacturers champions. And then, next slide, this, this, um, next one. Next one, so far we got two wins out of the first four races, so we're on, on track for another great season of the Daytona prototype. And then our biggest race, of course, is in the showroom, and despite uh, the final year of a uh, sixth generation of Corvette and a lot of new competitors out there, we're still the number one sports car in America. I, I did want to talk quickly about the, the 60th anniversary Corvette. People, there's still a few out there, I think. And this is what 60 years of Corvettes look like on one sheet of paper. It's kind of fun to see. Um, we have done, uh, we have a history of anniversary uh, cars, you know, uh, anniversary editions, and we're very proud the 60th anniversary not only celebrates 60 years of Corvette, but we were able to really go out in style, go out with, on a big statement with this great 
sixth generation Corvette with the anniversary package and the 427 convertible. They're doing the, some neat things like the uh, stripe package where it actually goes through the convertible top. I think we're the first ones in the industry to do that where it's, the stripes are actually stitched into the top. And also bringing back the 427 convertible, really a uh, car I think that'll stand the test of time. A unique package having that seven liter, 7,000 RPM engine in a convertible. We have the special blue interior, things like that. Um, what's happening? Okay. <laughs> I thought this was like a movie now. It's going so fast. Anyway, um, I do want to mention last year the ZR1 with the anniversary package was the, was the Indy Pace car. And next one, the uh, one of the things too about specialist car was just that if you get about the 427 convertible and it's a special anniversary, all that heritage things that means a lot to us. You tell your friends that's a it's a pretty high performance convertible supercar in its own right with a better power to weight ratio than a Porsche 911 Turbo, Cabriolet, a Ferrari GT convertible, or the uh, Audi R8 with the V10 uh, Spider as well. What's next? Uh, this was kind of interesting. I know uh, I know some people say is sending me emails. What do you guys think about the new Viper that's coming out? How are you going to handle that? Well, Car and Driver Motor Trend, you know, again, ZR1, it's its final year, 2013. Seems like they couldn't really match the 2013 Viper as the, uh, the ZR1 soundly beat the, the Viper in both at Laguna Seca, in both Car and Driver and Motor Trend. I think the Motor Trend came out and some of the uh, executives were very upset about what happened and tweeted and complained about it. And then the next magazine came out a week later and it summed up, you know, confirmed the first magazine. So. In fact, they even accused us of cheating, of sending in a ringer car, which is hilarious because uh, we're pretty busy over here getting the Stingray ready. We don't have time to go tweaking a ZR1. Besides, if we knew how to tweak a ZR1 to make it faster, we would have just sold it to you, too. <laughs> Great. Great. The new road and track has a neat article. You might want to check it out. They compare the ZR1 with kind of the ultimate streetcar performance to, to uh, 60s race car, Lotus 49, 49, kind of the ultimate Formula One car back in the 60s to see how, and it was remarkably how close they were, uh, that you get a car on the street that's basically as fast as the state-of-the-art Formula One car was <coughs> years ago. Next. Uh, some people told me they saw this movie, uh, not that necessarily it was the great movie, but the Corvette Zero One was really the star of this, the Arnold Schwarzenegger Last Stand movie. It was kind of cool, so you've seen some product placement. And I know people always ask me questions on uh, how the car is doing, what models. I think the interesting thing on here, a 427 convertible we built, uh, 2,552. So it was a very successful run, and again, a great way to finish off the sixth generation Corvette. Uh, and again, Arctic white, most popular color, we're in the 60th anniversary color, and black, second highest. This would be my turn. Well, on behalf of all the great men and women of Bowling Green Assembly, I want to say uh, welcome and hi to all of you. We're all pretty busy here with the plant. We have a f quite a few of us actually here today um, as we uh, take a little bit of break from what we're doing uh, over at Bowling Green Assembly. The, uh, the, the comments that, that Harlan made about the, uh, the 2013 model year are terrific in that because of uh, a number of things that we did for 2013. One, it was the last year of C6. Uh, two was the 60th anniversary edition, and three, of course, was the, just the iconic 427 convertible. Those three things taken together gave us a huge number of orders and a huge amount of opportunity for us as an assembly plant because, as you might guess, in, in my manufacturing world, volume is our friend. Uh, in many cases, if you announce the last model year of a car, your sales could tank and it would be problematic to keep your factory running. But because of those three things that I just mentioned, we ran at very high volumes. In fact, you can, oh, you can see earlier, we built 13,466 cars in the 2013 model year. And I, I, I want to remind you that that model year was about nine months long. We actually took three months out of that model year and built as many cars as we built in the two previous years as well, which were obviously 12-month model years. Now, the, uh, uh, what that necessitated then is we basically ran the entire 2013 model year on, uh, on five 10-hour shifts uh, a week. Uh, as you all know, Bowling Green Assembly only runs one shift, normally an eight-hour shift, but uh, we were on 10 hours, five days a week, with six Saturdays thrown in 
during the course of the year. So thanks to all of you who bought 13s. It allowed us, as an assembly enterprise, to do the kind of work inside our factory to prepare ourselves for this, uh, this new Stingray and the, the opportunity that we've got to build that car. One other comment that I would make that is pretty encouraging to all of us, uh, we stayed very clear on the message that while we had an increasingly larger number of our employees every day uh, getting focused on, this, on the Stingray as we entered the last phase of the C6 build, it was very important to all of us, and I, and I really mean all of us at the plant, that we continue to keep our eye on the ball with respect to the C6, uh, that we owed all of you who were gonna buy the 2013 C6s, we owed all of you the very best car that we could build. And we've been looking at some warranty data recently, and, and I know Taj and Harlan agree with me. The warranty levels on the, on the C6s, as we built out the last six months where the C6s, the warranty levels were the best they'd ever been in the history of the car. Uh, and so we are, yeah, thanks. With that, yeah. That's a big deal to us. Now, I don't want you guys to worry if you bought 2009s or 10s or something, it's bad. But, but it was, you know, oftentimes you can see in a product as a product finishes its life cycle that things begin to taper off or die out. And uh, we finished as strong as we ever could have. And we're absolutely delighted by that because at the end of the day, what really matters is what you, the customer, is, are getting. And, uh, and you're telling us that you love what you get. But the last car came off the line on February 28th, about 8 o'clock in the morning. It was, um, it was obviously a 427 convertible with a, an LS7 engine built by Taj. Uh, Taj and I had a chance to go to the uh, Wicks and Performance Build Center in Wicks in Michigan, and each of us built an LS7 that day. Um, it was back in February that we built those engines. Um, we, if, if you want to know, we exactly timed out. We, timed, we built them exactly at the same rate. <laughs> so there was, there was no competition going on when we, we finished there. But, uh, but Taj's engine went in this car. Uh, this car is now in the GM Heritage Center up in Sterling Heights, Michigan. It's one of our iconic uh, cars in the history of our company, certainly in the history of, of Corvette. Uh, the engine that I built, uh, a little plug here, is it went into the very last Z06 we built that will be a museum car uh, raffle uh, soon. So watch the museum website for that. Um, it's a good engine, believe me. It's a good engine that Taj built too. Isn't it? But, uh, but the, uh, it's an opportunity for us, obviously, to continue to enhance raffle. Uh, as I said, this was the last car we built. It came offline uh, that day, February 28th. It was a Thursday morning. As that car passed through every station inside the factory, uh, once that car left the station, we began to tear that station down and begin to make the transition for C7. In fact, when this car came off the line, the old body shop, those of you who have been in the factory, and many, many, many of you have, uh, you remember the, the frame shop where we welded the frames together. We had demolished the entire body shop. I couldn't have built another C6. If this guy would have come to me and said I could sell 100 more C6s, I said I couldn't do that for $100 million because we had already started the process of converting the factory over to, uh, to C7. Um, the, uh, the, the car was celebrated with uh, a great deal of fanfare around, um, but we really, you know, as I said, I think publicly, the car came offline at 8.04, and by 8.30, we were 110% focused on, on making the C7. Now, there was a number of very special cars that came off the end of the line near the end of the uh, model year, but the next photograph uh, is actually a car that came offline early in February. Uh, this was a Z06 with an engine built by Rick Hendrick for Rick Hendrick. Now, all of us know Rick. All of us know that Rick is a great friend of Corvette. In fact, as you all know, Rick has bought the first two, uh, the first coupe and the first uh, convertible for the C C7 for a cool $2.1 million, which all of which went, went to, or goes to charity. But, uh, but Rick is a great friend of Corvette. He annually buys a number of Corvettes, of course, and, and, but he is a great friend of us because he also owns a significant number of General Motors dealerships and sells well over $4 billion worth of our product every year. So if Rick wants something cool, we're gonna make something cool for Rick. Um, this, uh, this Z06 uh, was, as I said, had an engine built by Rick, but it also had the same VIN number as his very first Corvette. And of course, Rick is well into triple digits on Corvette ownership. But, uh, but we wanna do something special for Rick. So what we cooked up, Harlan and John and, and others cooked up, we would make that the very last C6 that we ever shipped. And so we held the car and held the car while we continued to, to run the ship lot down. And today, of course, if you looked over at our ship lot, there's not a car in it. And about March the 11th, uh, we had shipped every car, except Rick's. So we set up this photograph. I parked the car in the center of our 1,400 car ship lot. I parked the car, pulled an empty transport up beside it. 
And uh, Bob Buttons from the museum here came over and shot some photographs from the, uh, from the roof of our plant uh, for, uh, uh, as proof, as visual proof that this was the very last car we did. But what we did with that print then was, uh, as you can see, there's a lot of gray around that car. Um, I, we made it into a big poster-sized photograph. Every one of our employees in the factory signed it. We framed it, and it's now on its way to Rick, the Rick's uh, uh, Museum in Charlotte. Um, Rick is such a great friend of, of ours, and we, we really wanted to give him the kind of tribute that says, you know, what do you do for a guy like that? Well, you do stuff that's from your heart, and that's what, uh, that's what this tribute was. So, so as we look back on C6, we have, uh, have great memories of C6, but as we look forward to C7, we are working our tail off. Um, it's a very exciting time at Corvette Assembly. As I'm fond of saying, if it was new equipment, we installed it. If it's new employees, we walked with them. If it was concrete, we polished it. And if it wasn't moving, we painted it. So by the time you guys get a chance to come back into the factory, you're going to see an all-new environment uh, that is truly worthy of not only uh, our employees working there, uh, the product that we built, but also what you all as customers and enthusiasts deserve to see as a part of uh, this iconic American sports car. So, great fun going on over at the plant. Uh, I'm gonna head back over there shortly and make sure we're still doing it. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a great, uh, great pleasure to be a part of anything going on with Corvette, uh, this included. Thanks. Thank you, David. Dave's been an awesome partner. Uh, we've never had a better relationship between the Michigan contingent and the Kentucky contingent. Uh, all of us working shoulder to shoulder, uh, trying to make this car perfect. Uh, when it comes out and uh, make sure we get it in your hands uh, as soon as we can and as perfect as we can. Dave was being a little kind uh, on his engine story. We, we did build the two engines uh, on the same day, down the same line. He was ahead of me and he pulled away quite quickly, as you'd expect a manufacturing guy. We didn't build it in the same amount of time. He built his a lot faster than I built mine. And it makes sense that his engine went in the car that we're going to sell. That's the one we're going to raffle. You really want the engine built by the manufacturing guy? <laughs> A manufacturing professional, that's that's the engine you want to drive, whereas mine's more the showpiece, you know. Well, we'll just keep it at the Heritage Center and... Uh, showpiece, quarantining, same thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's an awesome experience. Anybody ever gets a chance to uh, do the engine build program, absolutely fantastic. And Dave, Dave would probably like to talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I should, can I talk about that for a second? As all of you know, at the end of January, we announced some very exciting news for Bowling Green Assembly. We are going to move the Engine Performance Build Center from Wicks of Michigan right inside our factory in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, that is going to offer not only the opportunity, yeah, thanks, it's really cool for us, it's very exciting. Not only does that continue to add jobs to South Central Kentucky, which is obviously very important for us, but it also offers a, a, the only place in the industry for a customer to come and build their engine. And of course, my vision is that a customer could come in, build their engine on Monday, and we'll put it in a car for them on Tuesday, and by the end of the week, we'd have that car off the line and almost ready to rock and roll. Um, the Engine Build Center is going to go, as I say, right in the center of the factory. Uh, it will continue to build high-performance engines for Corvette. But uh, uh, we will continue to offer the engine build, uh, 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 the customer build experience uh, for customers that are interested in building their own engines. And I think I can speak for both of us, Dad. We kind of went in there because it was sort of the, the you know, kind of the significant thing to do. But if you've done it, you'll know what I'm saying. You kind of get emotionally attached to that engine. I mean, it was really a cool experience. And when you put it into, into balance and you hit the starter and it starts, it's like, wow, this is really cool. I want this in my car. So anyway, we're going to continue to do that. Um, we're very excited about the opportunity to do that. It's going to going to add a little space to the factory and, and uh, create the kind of world-class environment that an engine build uh, uh, system needs to be. Uh, it happens to be something that in my previous career I spent a lot of time doing, so we know a little bit about this uh, process, so we're looking forward to having it in Bowling Green. We'll begin the, the movement of the engine uh, build center from Wixom uh, down here as early as July uh, and expect to be operational sometime in the first quarter of 14, so we're looking forward to that. So thanks, let me talk about it. Thank you, dude. Dave's been a great partner, but for anybody who's wondering, it's pure coincidence that we are dressed identically today. <laughs> <laughs> pure coincidence that we did not coordinate this. Anyway, anybody want to talk about C7? I will. You will? All right, well, let's let Harlan talk. Right, well, next one. <laughs> next one. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the introduction, uh, which was really exciting. And the neat thing about it, it was, you know, the 11313 introduction, very close to the 60th anniversary of the 
Corvette introduction of the Motorama show car at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, uh, almost 60 years exactly apart, which was pretty cool. Uh, next. This was a, a cartoon in Detroit News. You know, we had the Detroit Auto Show going, and they basically said, now playing the Corvette C7, and there's also a bunch of other cars there and stuff as well. But we actually had a, at the show, um, how many people were here for the, for there, not here, but there, for the uh, unveiling? So a few of you. A few saw it really, it was really cool. We actually had a car uh, up on the wall, full-size car. And we also, anybody was at the New York Auto Show? You. We had the car right when you, before you even walked into the auto show, there was a Corvette in the Javits Center high up on, on the wall too. It was kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, next. Um, and we heard this, uh, Bob Lutz, who, does, who uh, has seen a lot of product reveals and the car reveals. He, he, he told us it was the best reveal ever. And he said, and I mean ever. So next, next one. This is, I don't like to show a lot of charts, but this is kind of a chart we do in marketing for media coverage. And uh, you can't read it, but just the top bar is Corvette and the other ones are everything else. And that's basically the media coverage that came out by model on the uh, Detroit Auto Show. And if you add up all those little bars, they don't even add up to the one Corvette bar. <laughs> so next one. Hey, Phil, play, first play, Phil. It's about a five minute video on uh, some of the summary of the media coverage. salivating over the first new redesign in a while. It's the seventh generation Corvette Stingray unveiled at the big Detroit Auto Show. Unleashed in Detroit last week, General Motors is hoping the new Stingray will put America's oldest auto nameplate back in the winter circle. It's lower, wider, it's faster, and it's got an attitude. And guess who's back tonight? That little red Corvette. Here it is, Chevrolet rolling out the new model today, taking us back to the same car Prince sang about, the one that took America by storm 16 years ago. As the car was developed, and then just kind of steps something very special, but this particular Corvette, and I'm a big fan of Stingray, big fan of Stingray, so, you know, don't shoot it lightly, the fact that we
pretty ex exciting, and uh, my partner in marketing, John Fitzpatrick, is back there. John, wave your hand. Back there. Big part of the, getting, you know, the all the videos that have been out, all the, the early marketing materials and everything really created a lot of this excitement and buzz going forward. And uh, anything to Auto Week editors named it Best in Show. And Ted, you said yesterday, you know, there wasn't even any, not only was it unanimous, there wasn't even any other cars nominated. So it was an easy decision at Auto Week. Uh, next, um, you saw that uh, on the video, uh, the rights to buy number one. Uh, again, uh, Rick Hendrick, our friend, uh, goes to Charity Center Creative Studies on this one, uh, over a million dollars. And then the convertible also went for a million dollars uh, to help uh, uh, cancer. And um, a lot of people are, are surprised. Wow, I'm surprised the convertible went for as much as the coupe. But I'm like, well, the convertible usually costs more, so I think he got a bargain, really. Kind of saved some money there. There's a lesson there. Don't bid against Rick Hendrick for a betting one. Somebody must have been bidding against. And then uh, on the Super Bowl, uh, Baltimore Ravens quarterback Joe Flacco was the MVP. And not that he needs it with his new contract, but he's getting, a, uh, for his reward, a uh, 2014 Corvette Stingray as well for his MVP in the Super Bowl. Next. Uh, you can see um, we just dominated all the automotive magazine covers uh, for that month, and uh, we actually had a some of the slides we're going to see later were actually from some of the preview uh, information that we gave the media ahead of time so they have their stories ready to go. Uh, next. Uh, at New York Auto Show, I mentioned that before, we really had uh, Times Square all decked out in Corvette Stingray, huge uh, billboards and signs. It was really cool, you know, to see hit the mass market there in New York City with uh, Corvette Stingray, uh, huge posters and billboards and things like that. Uh, next. And uh, the show cars, um, uh, Kurt talked about this and, and Ryan, we really had a strategy with our early show cars was to show how you can create different looks, different images, uh, different themes for the Corvette Stingray depending on the, how you order it, the colors. So um, the uh, Torch Red car is really pure sports car, track oriented, you know, black wheels, adrenaline red interior. And then the cyber gray car with the Kalahari interior is more towards the luxury sport side, the more sophisticated GT, you know, your land-based corporate jet, you know, to take you wherever you want. So we really, depending on how you order the car, you can create different types of personalities within the design itself. So let's go to the next one. Um, now, um, now I'll talk about some of the, car, the cars that we have here. Uh, the Night Race Blue convertible, with the brownstone interior uh, was shown at the New York Auto Show was the introduction to the convertible to the US. And then this Laguna Blue Coupe here, this is the first time that this car, this is a new car that we haven't shown before, first time this is being shown here at the National Corvette Museum and we really wanted to show off the new Laguna Blue color and also has the, uh, the chrome wheels. Um, the Z51 package and it has a gray interior which we hadn't shown previously. Let's keep going. Okay, the, and the two interiors, this is the Kalahari and the uh, adrenaline red. Let's go next one. Hey. Well, Harlan was talking about the reception the car uh, received. We knew it was going to be a big automotive story. We didn't realize how big a story it was going to be kind of broadly, you know, culturally, and even uh, globally, really all around the world. Harlan and I were all over the place doing media, I was talking to Chinese TV, they didn't show in the video, but Chinese, two different Chinese TV stations wanted to do uh, coverage of it. We don't even sell the car in China. Um, so it's like, <laughs> is, there's, is Jake DeLong here? He just showed us a magazine from Japan that, that we were in. Right. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a huge uh, kind of pop culture story. I think uh, I saw something, uh, we were one of the top five uh, search items on Google, you know, they kind of track what people are looking at and, you know, at, at this time we were uh, uh, in the top five of Google. Um, when we did the live streaming of the, the reveal, I think that would have, I can't remember, I think it was ranked like 15th of all, if it was a TV program, like a regular cable TV program, it would have been ranked 15th, so we were ahead of like MSNBC and some surprising stations that you think people are watching all the time. Uh, there was more viewers actually watching our reveal, so 
uh, kind of amazing, really, uh, how big uh, a story it really was. So, and I think one of the big reasons the story uh, had so much pull is because the car really is a story. It takes a long time to even talk about all the technical details and all the things. Uh, we put a lot of thought into every single aspect of the car. You know, we just spent an hour uh, with Tom Peters and Kirk Benyon uh, talking about just the exterior uh, appearance. And uh, all of that stuff, you, you can't do it individually. It's not like you do the exterior uh, in one meeting and then you think about the interior, then you think about the chassis. It all works together. Uh, a modern car has a huge amount of synergy. The way it looks on the outside affects the way it performs. It's not optional to just style something and hope it's okay when you have engines that produce as much power as our cars do, as fast as the car goes. It's actually a safety issue. You have to have good aerodynamic performance. The car is going faster than a, a small plane takes off, you know, as, as you approach its top speed. And so aerodynamics are a critical uh, factor in uh, designing a new car. And all around the car, if you look at there's synergies between different su subsystems that have to be worked simultaneously, and that makes the car a huge challenge. So I, people say, well, what, how do you even do your job? And uh, the bottom line is our job is to, to select technology that makes sense for customers. Uh, there's a million different things we could do with the car, but we really need to cherry pick the technology that makes the most sense uh, for people who are the buying public. And so the test we have to use is what really improves the driving experience. There's lots of technology that's really cool, be fun to throw on there, but if it really doesn't enhance the driving experience, then it's really not worth putting on the car. You just end up putting a bunch of extra weight or a bunch of extra cost in the car for something that doesn't contribute to the core experience of, of driving the car. We don't design Corvettes to be isolation chambers to, to take you away from the driving experience. We're assuming people who are buying the car are, are buying the car because they want the driving experience. They want to be in touch with the car. They want to feel the road. They want to feel what they're doing and really enjoy doing it. So that's kind of the, the test that we use of uh, technology in the car. So let's go on to the next couple slides. You know, we, we really wanted to, and a lot of people were suspecting that maybe with the pressures on fuel economy and you know, trying to be sensible and reasonable people, maybe the car might get dumped down a little bit, maybe be a little softer version of itself, maybe a little slower, but you know, still a, a sporty car. Uh, we know from experience that uh, it's really bad business strategy to bring out a new car bet that's slower than the old one. <laughs> if, if we're gonna do that, you might as well just keep the old one. So in spite of, you know, we have to be respectful of and pay a lot of attention to getting the car efficient and making sure that the fuel efficiency is as good as it can be, we knew we couldn't step, take a step back uh, in performance. So that was, that's why performance is right uh, on the top of the list there. Got to get more performance, and I talked about the driving experience, everything that contributes to the driving experience, but got to pay attention to the efficiency. And really, efficiency is good for race cars. You know, you win races by being low mass, low drag, good fuel efficiency, you got less pit stops, uh, and all those same things contribute, you know, low drag contributes to high top speed. You know, the things that make a good sports car also make a car efficient. So we're always been doing this kind of focus on efficient fundamentals, making sure that we use the lightest weight materials, we design the car to be as light and efficient as it can be. Next slide. We decided to call it the Stingray for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, you heard Ed Welbert on the tape saying he's a big fan of Stingray. Uh, well, he's, he's been in charge of design at General Motors uh, for quite a while now, and very influential, uh, but we haven't used the Stingray name since uh, 1976. And uh, it would have been uh, easy for us to do a Stingray uh, special edition on the C6, for example, to try to keep, you know, try to pump sales and keep Bowling Green running, uh, but we would never do that. You know, we have too much respect for the name. Uh, the, the brand, the power, the value of that brand is too much to just stick it on uh, any old thing. Um, other manufacturers have done that and diluted uh, very valuable brands by doing that. So uh, we were kind of waiting until we had a full car worthy uh, of the Stingray name. And we kind of had it in the back of our heads at the beginning of the program. Maybe, maybe we could do a car that could be the Stingray, but let's just see how it turns out first. We wanted to make sure it had that formidable street curb appeal. It had to have the design language that evoked the Stingrow, the kind of hydrodynamic uh, form vocabulary that uh, Kirk and Tom uh, really focus on. It also had to have the interior appearance that we wanted. It had to have the performance technologies under the skin. 
It had to have all the technology content uh, that would make the car worthy in every dimension of the Stingray name. So really was one of the very last things we did was write the paperwork to call it a Stingray and put that uh, badge on the side. Next slide. So uh, one thing, if you went, and I did this, I went into dealers and I asked, uh, what do we need to do for the next Corvette? We've had the C6 out for a long time. And the number one answer I got was, well, the car is great. You know, it, it's got a huge amount of capability. It's super fast, it's very efficient, lots of luggage room. People can use it for a lot of different things. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, it's looked the same, basically, for so long. And so the answer I got most often was, you need a different body style. You need to showcase that the car is new. But that's a little bit of a problem because we don't want to make the car look different just because it wants to look different, just for different sake. We want to make it look different in a way that makes it function better. And having partners like Tom and, and Kirk uh, make that easy. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how do you take a car with similar proportions to today's car and make it look different. And now, uh, one of the ways you do that is by taking uh, lessons learned from the racetrack. In addition to the exterior appearance, we wanted to make the car feel kind of tighter, feel um, more muscular, more uh, athletic. Uh, and part of that was relative to the interior. Make sure the interior just fits you uh, like a glove and that all the controls really feel like an extension of the driver. Next slide. The aerodynamics I was talking about uh, are super important, and uh, we use the race car as inspiration uh, for what we could do to make the car look better at the same time, uh, making it uh, work better. So if you look at a C6R, you can see a bunch of functional vents uh, on the car. Race cars don't do anything frivolously. They do everything for a purpose. The only thing that matters is winning the race. So everything on the car is fully functional and there for a good reason. And uh, everything from the way the front end airflow goes, and uh, in this example, the rear inlets for cooling and trans, uh, cooling the trans and diff are uh, much the same as uh, what's on the race car. If you look at the back quarter panel, and I think the next slide has a blow up of it, you can see that inlet uh, panel, and that's where the air goes in uh, to cool the trans on one side and the diff on the other. Next slide. We do exactly the same thing uh, on the Stingray. You've got two really cool looking vents right on the quarter panel. Uh, we flow a lot of air through there and it goes through a heat exchanger, same as on the race car, except it's located on the, in the outboard corners, right in the very outboard corners of the rear fascia. The race car doesn't care about luggage room and so they route it basically straight through where the trunk is today. Uh, we have ducts that run parallel and run straight out the back and then we have the heat exchangers there, and then we exit the hot air around hidden. We kind of integrated the grills uh, around the lower rear fascia and around the tail lights. That's why they have kind of an unusual shape, is to uh, exit that hot air out the back end in a low pressure area. But everything you see on the car is fully functional, doing something to make the car handle better. <coughs> we show a lot of these graphics, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, this helps us visualize the flow of air around the car. You can see where the air goes in uh, through the front and up through a functional outlet through the hood. Uh, it's heated up there and then we route a bunch of that air uh, over the top of the car that helps create downforce uh, on the front end. And here's a view from the back and you can see how a lot of the air curls around uh, the back of the car and you can see the flow lines even up from the ground. That's why the back end of your car gets dirty. Uh, very aerodynamic cars uh, have a clean takeoff where the air separates cleanly and then there's a low pressure area behind and that low pressure area actually sucks things up from around the car and off the road and that's why you find the back end of your car uh, dirty after driving it. Next slide. A lot of other details uh, on the exterior. We've got a quarter window. That's there because of that quarter vent. Uh, we couldn't put the, or didn't want to put that vent in the hatch where the hatch is now. So we put a quarter glass in there and have a really uh, dramatic Z-shaped cut line around it. Uh, we have a two-tone roof. We're showing that on a lot of the, the uh, show cars with the, the clear-coated carbon. Uh, you know, we invented that uh, for the ZR1. Now we're taking it a step farther and actually doing a two-tone version of it as optional. Gives the car a really custom um, look that you, you won't see on any other car. We paid attention to everything from the badging, using premium badging and making a plush, plush with a surface. Very heavy use of uh, LED lighting in the front and the back. Um, 
lots of very uh, good detailed execution with uh, premium finishes. You don't find mold and color black plastic uh, on this car. Everything's finished in a premium finish. Next slide. So the interior, uh, as I said, had to fit you like a glove. The first thing we did is send uh, the interior folks out to the track to experience what the uh, driving a Corvette on the track is like. Wanted to make sure everybody understood that uh, Corvette interior is a high stress driving environment. It's a work environment for the driver. And so uh, when we eventually let you sit in these cars, which we eventually will do, uh, <laughs> you'll find that it does really fit you like a glove. And every surface you touch has been custom tailored for its function. So where your elbows touch the door armrest, you'll find that that padding is just compliant enough to be comfortable on long trips. When you brace your knee against the tunnel on a racetrack, you'll find that it's soft enough, excuse me, soft enough uh, that it doesn't hurt your knee, but firm enough that it gives you good support when you're uh, bracing yourself. So uh, Ryan and the team on interior did a fantastic job coming up with an interior that looks beautiful, but also very functional. Next slide. Here it is in red. Next slide. Really wanted to pay a lot of attention to craftsmanship. The interior was one of the criticized areas of, of today's car. So we wanted to use very premium materials like carbon fiber, aluminum, and leather and uh, tailor those in a way that looked uh, extremely well executed. Next slide. Uh, the steering wheel has been something that's been called in for criticism on today's car. We've been shrinking the steering wheel over time. When you shrink the steering wheel, it makes the car feel more responsive. It makes the car itself feel smaller. The wheel is down to 360 millimeters in diameter. It's getting smaller and smaller to the point where it's almost as small as what you see in the race car. Uh, the steering system is much different. The steering wheel, column, intermediate shaft, and the way the rack is attached to the vehicle and the rack itself, much stiffer, almost five times uh, stiffer than uh, the sixth generation car. That makes the steering response very linear, uh, extremely rapid, uh, and really good feedback. We've made uh, power tilt and telescope standard uh, so everybody can get uh, comfortable in this car. We finally bit the bullet. I don't know how many times uh, we've been uh, at shows like this and people have asked, you know, when are you going to fix the seats? And the problem is all of you are not the same shape. You know, you all have different shapes. Uh, and it's very uh, challenging to do uh, seats customized for different people and different purposes. But we did uh, decide that we were going to do two seats, a touring seat, a standard on the car. We worked on a new uh, seat structure, a lightweight magnesium structure that enabled a really dramatic shape to the seat. Also light mass and also very stiff, so it gives you very good uh, support. Uh, we added a power recline feature, so it's now eight-way, not six-way. And uh, if you look at the picture on the right, that's the competition sport seat. Uh, that has large cutouts in it for belt pasters, for people who want to put competition belts uh, in the car. And you can't really tell from this picture but it's trimmed in real carbon fiber, and it looks uh, really cool. That, that seat has very aggressive bolstering in it for people who really want to uh, do competition on the track. Next slide. Here's some uh, benchmark data. We actually uh, wanted to make a science project uh, out of the seat, so we took and put uh, what we call pressure mats uh, under the seat. So we took a, a variety of cars, and we put a, a mat that could sense pressure uh, very finely in a lot of uh, small, uh, small detail way. And we actually put it in the car and we took data in real time as people drove the car aggressively. We had people for all different shapes and sizes uh, driving out on our Black Lake at the Proving Grounds. And uh, they'd drive up to 1G and we'd take data to see where seats that people liked, put pressure on them to support them and make them uh, comfortable in a, in a, uh, a high performance driving and force environment. So we actually took that data and turned it into uh, an ability to create seat designs and shapes that do that without hurting uh, long distance comfort. And on the left you can see some of the, uh, the contours that we came up with. Another big important part of the interior is the information displays. Uh, we have two high definition screens in each car so that comes standard. You don't have to order navigation or anything and you get two 8 inch screens. These are uh, 720p uh, resolution, so pretty good definition for a screen that's 8 inches uh, diagonal. Uh, the instrument panel screen, the cluster, is a 650-nit screen. That's a very, very bright screen. Uh, it's in a binnacle, of course, so it never sees direct sunlight. 
we needed to go even higher intensity on the center stack in the center console because that does get direct sunlight and uh, you can have the roof out or the top down. Wanted to make sure that screen is readable even in bright sunlight. And so we actually have a thousand nit screen, uh, which we think is the brightest screen uh, ever put in a car. Um, I tell people, you know, Apple brags about their iPhone 5. It has a, a retina display uh, at 500 nits. So our cluster one is brighter than that, and the uh, center stack one's twice as bright as that display. The driver mode selector was uh, a new feature for us. You know, we've been evolving towards this direction for some time. Uh, we have one knob that sets up up to 12 different attributes of the car, customizes them for, uh, or optimizes them for different modes. We've got a weather mode, an eco mode, tour, sport, and track. And that button really changes uh, a lot of what you see and feel in the car. So the look of the cluster changes, the sound of the exhaust changes, the feel of the, uh, of the uh, suspension changes, depending on how you have the vehicle optioned up, it can control up to 12 different things. Next slide. This is a list uh, showing what has changed where. And uh, it, for anybody just coming to the car new, uh, this is a very easy way to get used to the car and, and uh, figure out what it's capable of doing. We also give you the option of going in and customizing uh, many of these features. So if you like to mix and match, uh, you can do that too through the menus uh, in the center stack. But for people just getting in the car, this is a, a great way to set up the car for how you want it. And these changes, many of them are not subtle. The steering effort, for example, changes dramatically when you go from tour, sport, to track. Same with the ride quality. And uh, we'll show you some of the cluster changes as well. You know, I, I saw an episode, I think, of Top Gear, where they got in, a, I think it was a, B, a BMW, and they're trying to set it up for a high-performance mode, and they went through all these screens, and they're talking about how it took them 10 minutes to figure it out. On the Corvette, you just click it two times to the right, and you're in track mode, and it sets everything for you. So you want to make something very easy to do while you're driving. You can change the character of the car uh, on the fly without having to go through a lot of menus and screens. Thanks, Harold. Here's some of the screens that you can get in the cluster. So showing you examples of the, uh, the uh, tour mode on the left, then the sport mode, kind of a traditional tachometer. And then in track mode, the screen changes to a display similar to what you'd see in the C6R racer. So very uh, graphically depicted information. Uh, you can see it displays the tack. It exaggerates the high part of the RPM band. So if you don't decouple it, the, you actually get these cluster changes on the fly. And then you can also customize within each one the, what you see in the middle through the driver information center. One thing uh, somebody was asking about yesterday, you know, you see the gear display, it's the big number. That's with both either the manual or the paddle shift and automatic, which is kind of cool. So with the seven speed manual, it's really, you know, you're starting to get a lot of gears, it's good to see where you are. Yes, and I'm going to talk about the seven speed manual in a little bit, and active rev matching, which is a new feature. And when you, you click the switch to turn the active rev matching on, you get this gear state uh, indicator from uh, white to amber. So you always know, and it also changes in the heads-up display too, so you always know if you have that feature on or off. So really cool, these are not subtle differences, they're obviously very big differences in the cluster. Next slide. And I mentioned the heads-up, we have a full-color, high-resolution heads-up display, it's very crisp, uh, having color is really cool. Um, the uh, heads-up is really kind of the next generation of technology. And this will also move as you go from tour sport to track. It'll go uh, to the setups, or if you want, you can decouple it yourself with the, the HUD controls. And one thing, uh, go back a second. I, somebody was asking me this too yesterday. People, the, on the track mode, those dots up there, those are actually um, shift indicators, like Formula One style. So it lights as it comes together. So it tells you the red lines. You can keep your eyes on the road, so you know when you shift. Yeah, they're not a gimmick either. Jim Merrow, uh, when he's on the track. He uses this track mode, and those are like staging lights as they come together, you get closer, and you get used to them timing a shift for you, and uh, he actually uses that on the track. Next slide. Uh, there's so much going on in the interior, uh, it's hard to describe at all, but uh, some other examples. One of my favorite is the hidden storage behind the center stack, that big eight inch screen. A lot of Cadillacs use uh, technology where they can pop the screen up and out of the IP. 
We're using a similar technology upside down where we drop it down into the IP. So in your normal state, it just looks like a perfectly flush, uh, big high resolution screen. But you hit a button and uh, you can see in this picture right up here, you can see it opens up a very big bin uh, back behind there. I think it's a liter and a half uh, of space. So you can hide a lot of big stuff in there. You can put your phone in there. Uh, you can see there's a USB port so you can uh, put your iPod in there and plug it in. And uh, then you can put the screen up and nobody knows uh, it's even there. So, and then you can control everything from the screen. It's really cool. Uh, you can put big uh, sunglasses in there. Um, really excellent uh, use of space here. Uh, some of the other things uh, that I didn't talk about, I talked about the seats a little bit, but having not just heated seats, but vented, cooled seats now. Um, the technology didn't invent, uh, hadn't been invented yet uh, in a way that would be packaged into the, the sixth generation car, but now it is available, heated and cooled seats. Uh, we have three USB ports uh, in, the, in the car. We have very big uh, map pockets uh, in the door for additional storage. Uh, one of the things you look at on these cars is the frameless uh, rear view mirror. It's a small rear view mirror, just big enough to see out the back. And it's not surrounded in plastic uh, like most inside rear view mirrors are. It's just a floating pane of glass. Uh, and it still has controls, uh, capacitive controls for the OnStar in it. So they look like they float uh, behind the, the glass face. It's uh, really a high tech looking piece. Cup holders have been improved. Uh, when you get the up-level audio, we have a, uh, a new um, subwoofer in the back. So you got subwoofers in the door and the back. And uh, we got a nine liter enclosure hidden behind that rear compartment panel. And uh, that can really put out uh, some serious bass. Uh, in fact, uh, they've tested the audio output of this system, uh, Bose has, and it's the highest uh, output system they've ever tested. The previous winner was the Cadillac uh, STS from years ago, which obviously had a lot more space for hardware. Uh, but we uh, are now putting out more sound uh, output than that car by a substantial margin. So there's lots more to talk about uh, on the interior. Uh, lots of nice little details that uh, Ryan and the team have put together. I just wanted to say something about the, the personalized interior flak is something that's pretty exciting where you can uh you know, you custom order your car, you have a plaque, you can order a plaque with your name on it, have your VIN number on it, built in Bowling Green, you know, Kentucky, USA for, for yourself. And then there's also, if you order a museum delivery, you have, there's also a special plaque for museum delivery which would have your name on it. And the, the exciting thing about these two items is these directly benefit the, uh, the Motorsports Park and the National Corvette Museum uh, because they're gonna be our supplier for these for these items, so it's 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 really exciting part of the whole process here. Bowling Green. Okay, next slide. On to the powertrain. I'll go through the powertrain quickly because a lot of that stuff uh, information has been out there already. And no, I'm not going to announce the SAE horsepower today. We haven't finished that work. I know everybody's anxiously awaiting, but we said it's at least 450 foot pounds uh, of torque and 450 horsepower. Uh, we're still putting the final uh, tuning and. Um, calibrations together. We have to do a witness test. It's actually an SAE witness test when you want to do SAE certification. Uh, so we have to finish that work. Next slide. But the engine is uh, really fun to drive. I can tell you that. Uh, we're not going to have driving impressions from journalists until this summer. Uh, but I can tell you um, from experience that this car is just a rocket to drive. And a, a big reason for that is the low end torque. If you look at the torque curves here, uh, almost 50 foot-pounds of torque uh, between two and 4,000, and that curve actually continues below 2,000. So in most of your driving range, you have a huge amount of torque available. The car feels really light and really responsive because of all that low-end torque. And we even put the 7-liter LS7 up there, and you can see in places we actually have more torque than an LS7. So that really makes the car feel really good in uh, every gear. We're using uh, direct injection and variable valve timing to uh, get a lot of that performance. And then we've also uh, added active fuel management, which is our cylinder deactivation technology uh, to this engine too. Uh, that uh, calibration, when you get an automatic car, uh, you get different calibrations. So when you're going from Eco to Tour Sport Track, you get more aggressive use of the four cylinder mode when you're in Eco mode than when you get in the other mode. On a manual transmission, this is the first car 
in history that's done cylinder drive activation on a manual transmission car. A lot of people predicted it was impossible, and it is very hard, it's very challenging. So what we've done is uh, we're introducing the car, at the, it goes into four cylinder mode in eco mode. So if you want maximum fuel economy, you put it in eco mode, and uh, it'll, it'll drop down to four cylinders, and uh, the rest of the modes, uh, it'll just stay in eight cylinders. And I know a lot of people were worried, am I stuck with this thing running in four cylinders all the time? No, you're not. And if, you're, if you have an automatic transmission, if you're manually uh, shifting it with the paddles, uh, it'll just stay in V8 mode there too. So here's some torque curve comparisons. Uh, there's ours for the LT1. Uh, here's our big competitor, the Porsche. Uh, this is their up-level engine. I, their their entry-level engine, the car that they sell for only $80,000, would be like off the bottom of the chart. So we put their up-level engine on there as a comparison. So there's the Porsche. Then we've got a BMW V8 uh, down there. And then even the Ferrari 458. Uh, it spins like crazy, but it doesn't produce uh, near as much torque uh, as the LT1. One of the most exciting things about this car, one of the things that makes it drive great, I was talking about how fun it is to drive with all that low end torque, we also have a huge number of shifting choices. Uh, the manual transmission uh, at a time when a lot of people are abandoning the manual, uh, going to paddle shifting only, uh, a lot of people are uh, just giving up on a traditional three pedal manual. Uh, we love it, we know a lot of the journalists love it, uh, it's really part of the driving experience, so we're doing uh, manual transmission unlike uh, any that's been done before. So seven forward gears, uh, we're doing a dual mass uh, clutch to help with uh, shifting, uh, the quality, not just of the, uh, the engagement, but also the shift quality. Um, we uh, have active rev matching, which uh, we're taking a step farther than anybody has taken before. Uh, it's on both upshifts and downshifts, and we have a special three-dimensional Hall effect sensor in the base of the shifter that anticipates uh, where you're going as you move the shifter. Instead of a uh, traditional system, you would wait until the transmission was in a gear, and then the car would know, okay, I'm in fourth gear, therefore the engine RPM should be this. The, the system's not as responsive as as if you know the shifter is moving to fourth and then you have the engine jump to where it's anticipating you're going to be uh, is much more fun, uh, I have to tell you. Uh, it, the engine seems very, very responsive and it sounds great. I think a lot of people are worried, well, you know, some direct ejection engines don't sound very good and this here's one that goes into four-cylinder mode. This engine sounds as awesome as any Corvette. Uh, really sounds good. So. Uh, as you move that shifter around, you have a lot of choices, and uh, I was telling the group yesterday, you can actually play the shifter like a musical instrument. Uh, as you move the shifter, you can just have your foot on the clutch and move the shifter around, and the engine dances around uh, to anticipating where you're going to go, and then when you finally land on the gear you like, you just pop the clutch, it's perfectly smooth, and you just take off. Uh, for the, uh, the, probably the biggest uh, thing we've got, remember I said when you, the, uh, the active rev match, that's controlled by, you know, some people are worried, am I stuck with that? No, you can turn that on and off too if you just want your traditional manual transmission. When you first start the car, it's just like a regular transmission. If you want the active rev match, we're using a paddle on the steering wheel too, actually, and all you have to do is tap it once. You'll see the gear state indicator in the instrumentation change, and then it'll do all the uh, flipping of the throttle for you. Okay, next slide. The, uh, the body structure is one of the biggest challenges we had on the car. You can see it out here. I think we've got it back here. It's uh, a beautiful piece of engineering. We've taken the best of the best in aluminum construction. We learned a lot doing the aluminum structure on, for the Z06 and TR1. This structure does not share a part uh, off that structure. This is completely new uh, from the ground up, clean sheet of paper using the latest technologies, not just to produce the individual components, whether it's 7,000 series uh, extrusions, high pressure die castings, hollow casting, a, a technology that didn't even exist uh, the last time we did this. So we're, we've strategically placed each of those materials uh, throughout the frame to let us thin the gauge where we could and use more material where we wanted to, uh, to really make this car uh, extremely stiff and extremely light and even more important than the global stiffness is locally. Everywhere a suspension uh, component attaches to the body structure, if you section it, if you cut through it, you'll see it's almost an inch thick uh, in places. So where you're reacting loads, you 
very heavy loads from the tire, you've got an extremely robust structure reacting those. The joining technologies is all state of the art. That's all been put together across the street in Bowling Green. It's really cool to look at. I mean, a lot of it is uh, human free. Uh, you know, some of the laser welding, the lasers are so powerful, they have to do special tests where they darken the whole uh, plant, put a bright light inside, and then they walk around the outside to make sure there's no leaks because you, you never, if the laser goes, uh, gets in point in the wrong direction, you don't ever want to get uh, that thing pointed at you. So they're in light-proof boxes, and uh, the operators at Bowling Green watch what's going on on high-definition uh, TV screens. So uh, really high-tech, uh, really cool. Next slide. So this is kind of gives you the layout of all those different materials. The bottom line is actually this slide's old. Uh, we saved over 100 pounds in the body structure versus today's car and it's uh, almost 60% stiffer uh, than today's car. That means the car feels more planted when you're on rough road, you don't feel any shake, the car just feels absolutely solid, very precision, very, uh, very accurate in the way it goes about uh, handling. Next slide. Looking long way back, this is kind of a uh, tale of the tape, uh, looking way back in history, all the way back to the fourth generation car. If you look at the blue bars, that's how much the body structure weighed the red bars uh, relates to how stiff the structure is. And so if you look back at C4, you can see high mass, uh, relatively low stiffness. We did a big paradigm shift on the C5, the fifth generation. You can see the main focus there was on improving the stiffness, getting the stiffness up to world-class quality. So you can see mass was uh, about a wash, but the stiffness was hugely improved. When we went to C6, we took a little mass out, Add a little bit of stiffness, just refining the body structure that we had it. And then we have another big paradigm shift on the C7 with the aluminum structure. Big decrease in mass and a big increase in body stiffness. So if that really affects the driving experience a lot. Next slide. Not just the aluminum, but elsewhere in the vehicle, we've tried to take mass out and use the latest technology in materials. Corvette has always been a mosaic of materials, really an experimental car in advanced materials, especially composites, even from the beginning in 1953. So we're continuing that. The, what's traditionally called fiberglass is not the fiberglass of old. It's evolved. It has a lot of new chemistry in it. Uh, and we've started mixing uh, carbon and glass uh, in some of the panels. It makes them lighter and stiffer. And then for the first time, we're making full carbon panels standard on the vehicle. So both the hood and the roof. So the panel that gets you know, the roof you want light so that it drops the center of gravity down. It also makes it a lot easier to take off and stow. It's a lot lighter. And then the hood taking weight off the front, uh, very important. So uh, we've actually uh, found a way to make carbon affordable on the standard uh, Stingray, which is a paradigm shift to the industry. A lot of people are scratching their head. You know, we announced the price, $52,000 yesterday uh, with Destination. A lot of people are scratching their head on how we're doing carbon fiber standard on a car that costs that much. Next slide. In addition, we focused a lot on taking mass out because we knew there were things that were gonna be pushing mass in. Many of those things driven by customer requests. Uh, we knew we wanted to get more efficient. We knew we had to put the technology in the engine with direct injection, variable valve timing. That hardware weighs quite a bit, actually, 16 kilos. Uh, we added to get to the, all the engine technologies. Uh, we also added a standard engine oil cooler. So that's the first time we've done that. Uh, we want to make sure the oil stays cool uh, as it operates in the engine. I mentioned the dual match clutch. That helps the shifting a great deal, but that weighs a little bit more. Uh, we had to stiffen the drive line uh, to make it behave very well when it's running in four cylinders. Uh, people will say, well, geez, why don't you just not do the, the cylinder deactivation and, and save the mass? Well, the cylinder deactivation is far away the biggest single fuel economy improvement we can make on the car. You could take several hundred pounds out of the car and you wouldn't save as much gas as being able to go into four cylinder mode. So the fact that we spent uh, seven kilos uh, increasing the driveline si stiffness pales in comparison to the fuel economy benefit that we got out of the cylinder deactivation. Uh, you can see the, I, I talked about the exhaust a little bit. We now have uh, exhaust with uh, electronically controlled valves in it, standard. 
And uh, if you get the NPP, you don't just get two valves, you get four valves, which gives you a lot of control over the sound quality of the car. Uh, when you add horsepower, you necessarily add hardware to uh, react to that. So you can see we put bigger brakes on, strength of half shafts, a bigger differential. Uh, you can see the long list of uh, items here that uh, is a necessary reaction to having more performance in the vehicle. Uh, some of the interior things, upgrading the interior and the seats, even though we use magnesium frame, uh, we improved the structure dramatically, and so uh, we added some mass there. Then there's a bunch of new safety requirements. It's been almost a decade since we designed the last Corvette. There's a bunch of new requirements, uh, not just U.S., but around the world for uh, uh, safety. And then uh, a lot of that electronic content and uh, new uh, customer features drives uh, new computers, larger computers in the car, and so that added mass as well. But we announced yesterday the, what we think is the, the final mass uh, of just under 3,300 pounds uh, for the curb weight, uh, just under 1,500 kilos um, uh, is what that translates to. And then we're going to start talking about dry weights. Many of our competitors uh, talk in terms of dry weight. So 3160 is uh, the new dry weight for standard car. I'll whip through the chassis here. Uh, the chassis is uh, basically uh, evolution of the short long run suspension we've been working on uh, for generations. We're really happy to have been able to reduce the turn circle by two full feet. That makes the car seem more nimble. Used a lot of mass savings, that same hollow uh, casting technique that we're using the body structure, we're using in lower control arms. Uh, that saved a bunch of mass. Next slide. The ELSD is one of the biggest changes in the way the vehicle handles. Uh, this is uh, part of the differential. Uh, it can go from an almost open, well, uh, actually an open differential to practically a locked differential. And this has a huge amount of authority uh, on the way the car behaves. It's able to stabilize the car in a way that the traditional stability systems can't. Uh, in part because it stabilizes the car without slowing it down. You don't have to hit the brakes. So once we get people, uh, the media out, and start showing them how much this affects the behavior of the car, uh, they're going to be really impressed. This is a great system. Next slide. I mentioned brakes. Uh, we've got Brembo brakes starting from the standard car uh, all the way up. Uh, we've got more swept area. We've got uh, fixed calipers and uh, just the best hardware we could get from Brembo. Next slide. The Z51, uh, Harlan announced yesterday, the price of this is uh, $2,800, and you get a, a huge amount of content. Uh, you get the dry sump, you get performance uh, ratios in the transmission, you get the ELSD I was just talking about, you get bigger shocks uh, for the, uh, the passive dampers, you get bigger brakes, uh, you also get the spoiler uh, on that, you get extra uh, you got a lot of changes in the aerodynamics, so there's a huge amount of content that goes along with Z51 to make that car uh, robust on the track. You get bigger wheels and tires, and uh, uh, really fantastic new tires for Michelin. The Grand Sport, as Arlen showed the data early on, the uh, Grand Sport is our best-selling model right now. And so one of the big challenges we had, we wanted to make sure Z51 could outperform a Grand Sport, and in fact it is. Uh, we haven't published any final data yet, but we're comfortably under four seconds, zero to 60. We're gonna have fantastic stopping distances with these tires and brakes. Uh, solid 1G cornering, and uh, Kirk talked about the aerodynamics, I talked about the aerodynamics, uh, I can't emphasize it enough. And pretty much out of the box, uh, this car was faster than a Grand Sport uh, on the track. And that is a, a huge accomplishment uh, for this vehicle. Should I keep talking, Mark? <laughs> it's a coffee. You know, we announced the, uh, the Corvette Stingray convertible uh, in Geneva, which is really exciting to, you know, to, to, to push, the, push this more global and into Europe to do a big, a major announcement like that in Europe. Next. Next slide. And then, uh, just like on the coupe, a lot of uh, magazine covers uh, also on the convertible introduction. Uh, next. The, uh, some of the highlights of the convertible, uh, it shares the aluminum structure with the coupe, which is really 
uh, it's very straightforward because the coupe has a removable roof panel and it's basically a convertible as well. So it makes it really um, helps that it was designed to be a convertible from the beginning. And we went to a fully automatic top, one button, no more mechanical latches or anything else that you have to uh, play with, just up and down the top. So it goes in about 20 seconds. And uh, another nice thing about it is that um, the top can be operated up to 30 miles an hour. So we know we like to do things fast on Corvette. So uh, if you get caught in the rain, no more pulling over and getting out of the car and working the top. So we go to the next one, and uh, this one we actually have a little uh, animation here that shows you how the top works. And what really enables some of that is that the uh, tonneau cover goes parallel to the deck lid in the back instead of straight up, so that enables it to uh, withstand the wind forces and be able to work at higher speeds. And the other thing we have too, now again, of course Corvette drivers, we, don't, we like to do things quickly, so before you even get in the car, you can use the transmitter and lower the top. Uh, before you even get in. So it's um, get on the road, then if it starts raining while you're driving, put the top back up so you don't have to stop for anything. Okay. There it goes again. All right, next one. Uh, of course, uh, we maintain the, the glass rear window and the froster. Um, it is more raked. I mean, um, Kirk went to the work wind tunnel on the convertible and actually is a benefit narrow to have more of a rake rear window and also is more attractive. And again, you can get uh, all the performance options on the coupe. You can get on the convertible, including the Z51 performance package and the dry, with the dry sump engine and all that, all that stuff, all the fun stuff. And we're going to have a wind deflector uh, uh, accessory uh, available. Uh, Similar to the sixth generation, there's the trunk partition that protects the top and cargo, but if the top is up, you can lower that partition and you get a lot more space if you're going shopping or buying something, something big. And uh, expect the convertible to be out fourth quarter of this year, towards the end of the calendar year. There are four top colors available. We have uh, black, gray, blue, and Kalahari. This, this car here we have on display has the blue top. Uh, this is some pictures of the, of the Geneva show car, which was a great top with the Kalahari interior. You can go past. Go to the next one. This is the car we have right here on display. This is at the New York Auto Show. And, uh, okay, so I know uh, Taj really enticed everybody with the great engineering in this car, and everybody's going to say, okay, now well, how do I get these? What options can I get? How much does it cost? All that kind of fun stuff. So we try to make it easier to order. We reduce down to three trim levels, three level trims, LT. So one LT, two LT, three LT. It's basically three levels. And uh, if you're familiar with how Corvette has been for the last few years, we've had four. So basically everybody gets an upgrade. So everything is upgraded one. And uh, we call the one LT is the purest package. It's obviously it's the least expensive, but it's also uh, for a lot of people, the one to pick because they want the lightest weight, you know, sports car they can have and the highest performance. So that would be the choice there. Uh, the second one, we call it the popular because it has kind of the popular comfort and convenience features and luxury features that, uh, you know, most of the Corvette drivers expect, you know, and want in the, in the car. And the 3LT is the ultimate, which features the leather-wrapped interior and really the ultimate, you know, trying to, in, in luxury GT. And we really, you know, the Corvette, although it uh, will go over the pricing, may be more attainable, we don't want any excuses to any sports car at any price. We want people to buy the Corvette because it's the best, not necessarily because it's the most affordable. Let's go to the next one. Okay, this is the 1LT uh, packet, uh, and basically features, you get three different color seats, but it's always a jet black interior. And, but the 1LT has a lot of things that you might not expect standard. Um, we have, the, like Taz described, the two high definition displays, one in the cluster, one in the center, that is standard in all Corvettes, those color eight inch displays, which also enables any Corvette to be ordered with an optional navigation system. Eight way power seats are now standard, so we've moved the recline uh, function, is now power operated as well, and that's standard on both seats. And also the steering column, tilt and telescope power is standard as well. Uh, of course, we still have the keyless uh, push-button start, 
uh, the seven speed transmission with active red matching. Rear vision camera is also standard on all Corvettes. Uh, and the carbon fiber uh, removable roof panel and the carbon fiber hood, the room structure, the driver boat selector, and even the 1LT has a nine speaker Bose audio system that is standard. So there's a lot of stuff in there, even in the 1LT. So the 2LT uh, adds a bunch of stuff. That uh, The first thing you notice in the interior, there's more color in the interior, the console, the armrest, and uh, the seats upgrade to so have the lumbar and wing adjustments, and also you have the heated and cool uh, ventilated seats. So a lot of people for the years have been asking for that option. Um, there's the Bose Premium Audio, the Tad subscribers would have add the subwoofer in the back, so you have 10 speakers in the back. There's the memory package. Remember, the nice thing about the memory package, now it works with the recline because you have power recline, so it works with the steering wheel, the seats, and the mirrors. Uh, the head-up display comes with the 2LT, the color head-up display that we talked about. You get a one-year subscription to Sirius XM, and uh, some things like that. So let's go to the 3LT. Now the 3LT is really our luxury interior, again, leather-wrapped instrument panel and doors, more color in the interior. Uh, the seats are upgraded from uh, the leather to Napa leather. It's really one of the best leather shoes and automotive seatings that's out there. Uh, the navigation system is included, standard in the 3LT, again, optional in the other ones. And uh, there's also an extra option you can get on the 3LT, which is something new. Again, not wanting to have any excuses with any sports car in any class. It's, it's a suede upper, uh, wrapped upper interior trim. This wraps all the upper surfaces, like the headliner, the visors, the eight pillar, around the quarter windows, wraps all that in suede. So it's really, I call it the frosting on the cake option. You really get, you know, really a very luxurious interior with that option that's available on the 3LT. So we try to, uh, I know you can't read this very well, but we tried to make a 10-step, uh, try to say, here's how to order your car in 10 steps, you know, and I'll just summarize it. And again, all this information uh, that I'm going over is, uh, uh, is in the hands of our Chevrolet dealers right now. So we have all the ordering information and all the pricing information. So uh, the first thing we want people to is pick their chassis. We have three, you have the standard, you have Z51 and Z51 with magnetic ride. Of course, the level of trim that we just went over, one, two, or three LT. Uh, the colors, interior, exterior, tops. We have the two seats, the GT seat and the competition sport seat. And the same level of equipment goes whether you have the, the GT seat or the competition sport seat. So that can be had with the cool and heated seat, heated functions as well. Uh, of course, the transmission, uh, the exhaust, you get the, uh, the, the standard performance exhaust, different wheel options. We have silver, uh, machine, black, chrome, uh, the, the roof panels. We actually have three roof panels uh, that are available. We have the painted roof, the um, Laguna Blue Coupe in the back as an example of the all blue painted roof. It's still carbon fiber. And then on the other two cars, you may have noticed the red and the gray cars we've been showing. Those have the visible carbon fiber clear coat that looks like the zero one that Tad talked about with the two-tone look. And we still have the transparent roof panel as well. It's navigation. And then we have some personalization options as well. You can get red or yellow uh, brake calipers, color options. We have a carbon fiber interior trim package, which puts the interior with real carbon fiber and uh, the suede upper trim I just talked about. Let's go to the next one. Uh, here's the 10 colors available. The two newest colors we have on display, of course, the Laguna Blue car, and we have a lime rock green uh, hood that, uh, that uh, was brought over from Bowling Green, so you can take a look at, at the, the lime rock green, which is kind of exciting. It's kind of exciting now to launch a new generation with a new color we haven't had for a while. As you recall back the 2005, sixth generation, we had the orange, Daytona Sunset Orange, we hadn't had orange in a Corvette in quite a number of years. So we thought this time, let's, let's try the green, try something really different that we haven't had in a while. And I think it's gonna be a very striking car. Let's go to the next one. This is the, uh, the interior colors, uh, and this is the, the three LT because we have jet black. Let's go to the next one. Um, next slide, please. The adrenaline red, and you see the color break up in this one. The adrenaline red and the next slide is the gray, which is the car we have on display. They have a certain color breakup. And then you go to the next slide, see the Kalahari 
And the brownstone has what, you know, Ryan showed this in his interior presentation, Ryan and Lucy, that's what we call a dipped interior. So for those colors, we added even more interior color to the full instrument panel. So this, this is the Kalahari, and this is the brownstone. And the brownstone is only available on the 3LT, and it's kind of our showcased interior. As you look at it, it actually has extra suede accents throughout the interior. It's really kind of one we wanted to make special only for the top level. Uh, for wheel options, and this the, the standard uh, Stingray wheel, 18-inch uh, front, 19-inch rear. See on the left side, you can get silver, machine face, which is really you know more of an honest, pure aluminum, uh, uh, brighter look, and then the chrome. And in the Z51 package, we have a sterling silver wheel, black, and chrome as well. Some of the accessories, we're going to have a lot of accessories available. This is just a few of them. Um, the, uh, the convertible here is an example of our new torque wheels. Those are available in silver or chrome. It's kind of a, a neat looking wheel. Uh, we're going to have uh, a bunch of Stingray logo items like center caps, console, things like that, a convertible uh, windscreen. And uh, we're even going to have, um, I talked about the interior plaques before. If you're buying a car out of stock off the dealer lot, and you may want to participate in that, but we know we get impulsive, we see the car we want, we want to buy it, you can through the Corvette Museum buy the Court, National Court of the Museum registry plaque for your car with your name on it as well. And uh, one of the things we're excited about is this uh, Corvette luggage option, Corvette custom luggage. It's something we want to do for a while. It's, uh, it's a special uh, five-piece luggage set. It's a design, see it fits nicely in the back uh, as well. And has five pieces, two airport roller bags, a messenger bag, duffel bag, and a backpack. And it's available as a check-the-box option. Okay, we went over this yesterday. You know, in the past, we could have like a press release and if your presentation was, you know, a half an hour later, you could still kind of surprise everybody. But today, the way everything is connected, everybody kind of knew about the pricing anyway. So it, what I did this time, uh, I got a lot of questions on uh, some of the price and individual options. Again, so you don't have to write all this down, but I want to go over some of the key ones. And of course, your dealers have all this information. So let's go forward. Uh, this is the, the Stingray Coupe, 51,000 without uh, destination. And the convertible is 56. And the Z51 package option is 28. So let's go to the next slide and, um, and click again. Let's get all, these up, get all these prices up. And so this is including the DFC. And I got a lot of questions on the different options you see. You know, even the, the Coupe 3 LT at 60,000 is, is a pretty uh, neat package, and then the convertible packages follow suit basically um, the same way. And then uh, some of the key options, uh, there's a big list here. Uh, a lot of the options are very similar. If it's a similar option, in the most part, a lot of times it's similar to what we've had uh, previously, like the brake caliper color options, the same as it was before, things like that. Some of the ones that are a little bit different are uh, the six-speed paddle shift automatic now includes remote start, for the first time we've had that on Corvette. Um, we have the, um, the different wheel options, again, similar pricing that you've seen. On the competition sports seat, again, that, that'll be a little bit of a late availability. There's really two levels. There's the leather seat and there's a suede seat, and the suede version comes with also a suede steering wheel and a suede shifter and, and boot, so it really gives you that, uh, that track-oriented uh, feel. You can, you can also get um, suede inserts on the 2LT or 3LT seats instead of leather as an option. Uh, the navigation package, because you have uh, a standard uh, screen, is a lot more affordable at $7.95. And um, what else? We have the uh, personalization plaque on here, 200. But again, all this information uh, is available at the uh, at the dealership. And go to one more. Uh, I wanted to do one on the roof options, that's specific to the coupe. We actually have there's the, the three roofs: the transparent roof, 985, the visible carbon fiber roof panel, again with a special process. And you can still get a dual roof package. You can get one of the solid tops with one of the transparent tops. And unfortunately, we don't have the Harvey Gluck package. He wanted all three roofs. <laughs> but we couldn't figure out how to get all three roofs in the car at the same time before. So I think that's something we gotta work on going forward. But we do have, we do have, you can get the dual roof in two different ways. 
Okay, so I think, uh, I know we've got a question here already. I can't imagine you have any questions. Request. Request. Magnetic ride on the base car. Yeah, we heard that request yesterday. And uh, How many people want magnetic ride on the base car? Okay. All right. Thank you. We got a few. We listen to you. We listen. We had to pick one. They made me pick one. And uh, we thought that, you know, that's something we were going to want to do. But magnetic ride on the Z51 car with the more aggressive suspension is more of a, well, if you had to pick one, would be more of a, you know, makes it more of a, a daily driver, makes it more comfortable. So it has more benefit to put it on the Z51 car. But, but going forward, we just want it. Okay. Everybody understands why they just want it. Say, that's what I say. I can't say that. No. Yeah, and uh, there's probably other examples where the C6, through nine years, we came up with all these different permutations and combinations. There's, it would be impossible to replace the full C6 model lineup in one year. It's early. It's early. It's not the first year, but... We know what you want, and we'll go work on it. <laughs> All right. Who else has a custom request that we haven't covered? <laughs> Any other options we're missing? <laughs> yes. Is it possible, Harlan, to have an option where you have a competition seat? I heard about you already. <laughs> I was already sure warned about you. Two different seats. Sure, no problem. Just order them through uh, service parts and bolt them in yourself. <laughs> I would recommend buying two cars and then switching. <laughs> Even better. Good one, Harlan. Yes. Uh, we really have a different electrical system. Yeah. I don't know if they would physically, they probably would physically they might that physically guess, motor, but, but it's totally different. Nothing would work. System. No. So you got to get a new one. Be like, be like a sponge money. Who else got right here? That's good. <coughs> yes, has the, the question was, is the uh, non-Z51, do you still have a limited slip differential? Yes, you have a, a mechanical limited slip differential. In the back. You're asking about the heat in the cup holder? No. And the console. In the console. In the console. The heat in the console. In the console. Okay, we, we didn't talk about that a little bit, but we did uh, try to help out there with some uh, NASA space age materials. Uh, if you've ever heard of Aerogel, if you haven't heard of Aerogel, look it up on the internet. Uh, we have the most advanced acoustics, uh, not acoustics, a thermal resistant material uh, basically known to man. NASA developed it for spacesuits, and uh, it's the best thing you can get. We put layers of it along the side of the tunnel under the carpet, and then we put it under the cup holders, and we put it under the console. Uh, look it up on the internet. It's really cool. It doesn't take all the heat out, but it takes the edge off. Wait. Launch control only on the manual or is it on the automatic? It's on every Corvette, manual or automatic. You get launch control. That was the question. Yes, standard on all. Thank you. You uh, change the bottom of the car, now the quarter is slightly right, put something else in there. Oh, you're asking about the balsa wood floors? Yes, for fifth generation and sixth generation car, we did balsa wood core floors, so fiberglass top and bottom, balsa core in the middle. It took 20 years for man to invent something better than the natural balsa, but we did eventually find a uh, structural foam. Uh, it's actually more expensive than the balsa wood, but uh, it does a better job with uh, acoustics and stiffness of those floor pans. But it took a long time to invent that. Do you by any chance have a price on stripes on the car? You know, price on stripes? Painted stripes? Um, yeah, we have it. We, that hasn't been released yet. We'll, we'll, uh, we will have, um, I was telling this already, we're going to have some stripe packages that will come out uh, 
pretty soon. That'll be factory installed, and we're going to have a, a full length stripe and a um, also a kind of what we call the stinger stripe, you know, on the hood, and, and, and different colors available. So that'll be announced. But no soon. price. But I don't, I don't have that right now. Okay. How about back here at the round table? Um, we're seeing a future seven speed automatic to go with a seven speed manual. But we never talk about future product. Um, we just encourage you to come to the birthday bash every year and we'll tell you what's new. I didn't say yes. Say no. What percent of the cars do you expect you want to be ordered with the Z51? What's your projection? We are projecting about half and half. You know, it'll, at the beginning, at the beginning a lot of people will get the cars loaded. And then we'll taper so off back to a steady state, state over time. Yeah. It, that's actually what's wrong about right now. That's yeah. something what here? I would say With so. the option of the uh, fourth seat right. and the ability to use that seat for the harness, is there a uh, factory uh, included <coughs> way of getting a harness bar to go across behind the seats? I mean, you know, so a little fixture or something in the aluminum housing that you can just use the the answer is no, there's no factory installation of that. Uh, we did our best to make sure the aftermarket can take care of that. We are required by law to provide the seat belts that meet all the safety requirements. Uh, anything that we put out there that's a partial step in the direction for off-road track use uh, makes us liable for the performance. And so our policy is to provide the legal stuff, where we can, we help out. There's places in the body structure where it's maybe a little thicker for somebody to attach something, uh, but we don't uh, take the next step and actually uh, uh, put in the provisions for it. Okay. Yes, hit. Launch control is automatic. Describe how that works. Just hold the brake and let go of the brake and floor it and let go of the brake. Yep. Just as you would expect. Punch it and hang on. So it manages the wheel spin. This this car has so much low end torque that you basically, in fact, you almost don't. You almost need to have launch control just off the line. If you just mat it in the automatic, you've got lots of wheel spin. Just to go a little further to answer your question, you put it in track mode. You have to hit the uh, traction button twice, and then you hold the brake, pretty wide open throttle, and let go of the brake. Brake. Well, you have to step on the brake. Yep, prescribed RPM, and then you just let go. It's really a lot of fun, but I don't recommend doing it on the, uh, you know, out, out of the toll booth or anything like that. They can have power by About over here. Yeah, the upper, you're talking about the upper suede interior. Yeah, that's a separate light on it. It requires 3LT, um, and again, it includes the... It's, it's suede, it's always jet black on the upper, but it's the suede wrap, eight pillars, the windshield, it has it on top of the windshield, the headliner, the visors, behind the, in front of the rear window, down the quarter, you know, basically all that upper trim that you'd have would be covered in, in suede. It's pretty good. Oh, it's uh, 995. You know, everything's 995 nowadays. Do <laughs> <laughs> we have another question? <coughs> The question is, when we, we haven't finished our fuel economy testing yet, so we don't have our final label. Uh, the, uh, you can't use eco mode as your label. It'll end up being a mix of the modes, um, average like between eco mode and kind of a standard mode. So when, when we come out with that, probably what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, here's, here's the fuel economy label as the federal government uh, prescribes that we test it, and then we'll do our own test in eco mode, we'll tell you how much better it is. Over here. It's a single rear battery. The question was, the, what does it mean to put the battery in the back? It's a lot like what we've done. It's an upgraded battery from today, and it's in the right-hand bootleg pocket, as we've done on uh, some of our models. So that's standard now. It's, a, uh, it's upgraded from today, so I can't tell you what it is exactly. More electrical content in the car and drives a bigger battery. More questions? <laughs> okay. Will. Uh, in fact, you have the right? 
We have a backup camera, but we do not have rear park aids, which I think is what you're talking about, where it beeps at you when you're about to hit something. No, we're counting on people to look at the screen, and we got a nice big screen so you can see what's back there. We're counting on you to use your eyes not to hit something. Front. We haven't invented a way to do that in the front yet. Well, you know, and, and you know, uh, Kirk and Tom don't like that, but all these little ugly sensors on the car, it looks so beautiful the way it is, so it's kind of a tough one. You know, we're going to find, if we do it, we want to find a way that really is well integrated and looks right, and we don't want to put, like some cars have these sensors on it. We know how people care about the appearance of the body, so. Uh, on the Z51 package, because I'm very serious at looking at it, you get Z51 package with the six-speed automatic valve shifter, Try some this time, but you could not do that on a Grand Sport C6. Yes, that content is the same, C51. So you do, you do get it on the automatic transmission, you will get to try some. Yes, you do. We listen. We listen. <laughs> okay, right here. Uh, how much more for that extra speaker, that uh, the upgraded speaker, the Bose system? Well, that's that's just included in the you know when we went over the two that's included when you get two LT or three that comes with that that comes up in the car. If you get the three LT, you get the ultimate bowl system. Yes. Oh. Okay. So we just link that into the package. Okay, we're getting down to the end. Anybody else? Jake always waits. I'm gonna make it easy on. Now he's gonna slam us. No, no. <laughs> First, well, really, here. I got it, Marlon. <laughs> really, for SAE, we always get that a lot, especially a lot of blogging back and forth. Can you give us a real summary? That's where you send the engine off, a different group looks it over, they give you a result, and that's what the number we go with? Is that, can you Actually, give us a... more than you bring a witness in to observe your test and make sure you're not cheating. Who wants to be a witness? <laughs> <laughs> and then, so let's assume the number was 456. Is there an edict at General Motors that says that's what you're going to use, or can you still say, well, it's 450, but even though you know it came out better than that? Uh, there's no edicts. We just tell you what it comes out to be. You know, we don't okay, I didn't know. But for marketing. Do you have like a favorite number you were hoping for or something? Uh, I thought it might be 480. 480. 680. And second question, real quick. How about Lady in the Pink back here? We don't know the top speed. We haven't tested the top speed. Uh, a lot of people think the car is done, but it's not done. We still have some final testing to do. Uh, Dave's building the first cars uh, off the line since we rebuilt the plant. Some of those cars are for the last minute testing. We don't do top speed testing here in the U.S. We go over to Europe uh, and do it, so we have a, a trip planned. We're going to go over there and do that. C6 was 190. C6 Just was 190. saying. <laughs> it won't be slow, and it won't be limited. It'll be whatever the car will do. Here we go. Jake's got a little Yeah. That's why I came up. You know, you mentioned that the PVC was moving down there. You were going to send that by the fourth quarter next year? No, the first quarter of 2014, we expect to have the PVC up and running. <laughs> the uh, preparing to build uh, engines in Bowling Green. As, as yet unspecified, we don't talk about new product programs. <laughs> but one can surmise. Yeah. <laughs> you just want to have the capability ready for any eventuality. <laughs> one more. One more. Really, uh, Harlan, was there really any discussion? NPP has been pretty strong. Was there any discussion of really tying it to the Z51 package and just making it part of the package? as opposed to a separate option. We kind of keep it separate so people can get it whichever way they want, basically. If you want to waste your money on an aftermarket exhaust or something, you can, I guess you can still do it. <laughs> and is it true, though, what you mentioned earlier, it will be an additional horsepower for NPP? Well, it is lower restriction, but like I said, uh, we haven't finished our testing, but you would normally expect lower restriction to result in more horsepower. Anybody else? Okay, one more. We actually got a thousand yesterday, and that was our limit. Sorry.
We'll probably do them at the same time. Question is, when are we going to do the Nurburgring? We'll probably do uh, top speed testing and Nurburgring at the same time. And just so everybody knows, you know, we don't. It's not our mission. We don't make it our corporate mission to go fast at the Nurburgring. We go to the Nurburgring to do chassis tuning and final validation, make sure the car is robust there. If we get a chance to run a fast lap, we do. But like the last time we were there, we ran two fast laps on the ZR1 to get our 719 and only a single fast lap on the Z06. One lap is the only chance we got uh, in 722. So um, it may turn out that we go to the Nurburgring when we don't have a lap time. We just do our work and we come home. Um, so there may not be a, a lap time. So it's very expensive and very uh, challenging. We should make it our mission. We're accepting contributions in million dollar increments. <laughs> I got one. Okay, got one right here. Is the, is the performance exhaust, is it titanium like it was on the C5 Z06? Or? And we've told that story all the way through the, the sixth generation car. We did titanium uh, back on the C5 Z06. That was an experiment, uh, not just us, but our partners at Timet and I think it was CalSonic at the time. Um, they gave us the titanium at cost, uh, CalSonic built it and sold it to us at cost, and it was barely affordable to put on the car. Since then, the price of titanium is more than tripled, and uh, so it's really unaffordable. We can do carbon fiber on the car uh, more easily than we can do titanium. So that was like a little window in time where it was affordable, and you know, that's part of our jobs is to look at the relative price points of different technologies, and you know, ones that represent a good value for you, you know, to be able to sell the car at a reasonable price, we put those in. If stuff gets unaffordable, we just we have to bail. But you know, okay, we don't have titanium anymore, but we got carbon panels standard. So you know, that's the relative price of the two technologies. So is it going to be stainless steel? Then? Yeah, it's kind of a traditional stainless steel. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Appreciate that. In spite of all the pointed questions. <laughs> About a favor. Could everybody you got here, your team, could we get a shot with all of you together at one time? Hey, after we answer one more question right behind you, we'll do Is there any chance you're going to open the trunk in the hood for us at all on the blue car? Let us see it. If we had keys. <laughs> oh. We anticipated that one. It took us a while to get there, but thank you very much. Take, always a good idea, we'll do a yep. picture, and then we can go by the bars and answer the questions. Yep. Okay, yeah, everybody up here. Thank you, but thank you very much for listening.